Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Moody Adams. I'm the Strauss Professor of Political Philosophy and Legal Theory at the, in the Department of Philosophy at Columbia. And I'm pleased to welcome you to this panel discussion of a new book by my colleague, Justin Clark Doan, entitled Morality and Mathematics, published by Oxford University Press in 2002. Justin is currently Associate Professor of Philosophy at Columbia. And in addition to this forthcoming book, his work has been published in numerous journals uh, in philosophy, including news and ethics. Our speakers beyond Justin today are David Papineau, who is Professor of Philosophy of Science at King's College London and visiting presidential professor at the CUNY Graduate Center. He's the author of Knowing the Score, What Sports Can Teach Us About Philosophy and What Philosophy Can Teach Us About Sports, as well as Philosophical Devices, Proofs, prob Probabilities, Possibilities, and Sets, and Thinking About Consciousness, among other published works. Katya Maria Vogt is Professor of Philosophy at Columbia University. She is the author of numerous books and articles, including Desiring the Good, Belief and Truth, Law, Reason, and the Cosmic City, and Skepsis and Lebenspraxis. She's also the co-editor of a book entitled Epistemology After Sexus Empiricus, and the editor of Peronian Skepticism in Diogenes Laertius. She's received many honors and awards, including fellowships from the Templeton Foundation and the Princeton Council of the Humanities. And finally, Michael Harris is professor of mathematics at Columbia University. He is the author of Mathematics Without Apologies and co-author with Richard Taylor of the geometry and cohomology of some simple Shimura varieties. And he's received a number of prizes including the Clay Research Award, which he shared in 2007 with Richard Taylor. And after our panelists have spoken, we'll have some time for questions from the audience. You should see a question and answer, a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, where you'll be able to submit questions for me to read aloud. And without further ado, I ask Justin to give us a wonderful account of his book. Uh, thanks so much, Michelle, and, and thanks to David, Michael, uh, Katya, and everyone at the Hyman Center uh, for making this possible. I, I feel really privileged to be able to, to think through these issues with all of you. Um, philosophy has traditionally had systematic ambitions uh, to understand, as Wilfred Sellers famously put it, uh, how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term. However, as philosophy has become increasingly specialized, these ambitions have become increasingly threatened. A case in point concerns the question of realism. To what extent are the subjects of our thought and talk independent of us, independent of our minds and languages and practices? Uh, a common naturalist position combines realism about science with anti-realism about value. Uh, but realism about science presupposes realism about mathematics and indeed logic and modality, the theory of possibility and necessity. So whether we can be naturalists turns on whether we can be mathematical realists, but moral anti-realists. Despite its importance for systematic philosophy, the debate over the question has been mostly limited to trading impressions. Um, the problem is specialization. Morality and mathematics are such different subjects and philosophy has become so specialized that nobody really knows whether one can be a moral anti-realist and a mathematical realist or whether ethics and the philosophy of mathematics have anything else to teach each other. My book, Morality Mathematics, seeks to rectify this situation. Uh, it explores arguments for and against moral realism and mathematical realism and how they interact. It concludes with surprising lessons for philosophy generally. Among other things, it shows that practical questions, as opposed to questions of fact, are the ones that are really at stake in traditional philosophical controversies. Uh, let me briefly uh, summarize the chapters. Uh, in chapter one, I clarify the concept of realism and distinguish it from related concepts with which it's often conflated. I show that properly conceived realism has no ontological implications and the common objections to realism fallaciously assume otherwise. That is, it has nothing to, no implications for what exists. 
Uh, I conclude by distinguishing realism from objectivity in a certain sense. Objective questions, in my sense, are those that admit of a single answer. By contrast, in a disagreement over a non-objective question, we can both be right. I use the parallel postulate understood as a claim of pure geometry as a paradigm claim that fails to be objective in the relevant sense, even if mathematical realism is true. Conversely, I explain how realism about claims of a kind may be false, although they are objective in a sense that the parallel postulate is not. In chapter two, I argue that our mathematical beliefs have no better claim to being a priori uh, justified than our moral beliefs. That, that's the way they're commonly thought to be justified. In particular, they have no better claim to being self-evident, provable, plausible, analytic, or true by definition, um, or even initially credible than our moral beliefs, despite widespread allegations to the contrary. I consider the objection that pervasive and intractable moral disagreement betrays an obvious lack of parity between the cases and argue that there is no important sense in which there is more moral disagreement than mathematical disagreement or in which it is less tractable than mathematical disagreement. A common argument to the contrary simply confuses logic, that is the question of what is true if something else is true or what is true if the axioms are true, with mathematics proper, the, the, the non-logical part. I conclude with the suggestion that the extent of disagreement in an area in any familiar sense is of doubtful epistemic significance. In chapter three, I argue that our mathematical beliefs also have no better claim to being a posteriori or in other words, empirically justified than our moral beliefs. I focus on Gilbert Harmon's influential argument to the contrary. Harmon argues that since the truth of our mathematical beliefs is indispensable to our scientific theories, while the truth of our moral beliefs is not, only the former are empirically justified. I show that even if this argument were sound, it would at most establish that a subset of our mathematical beliefs uh, has better claim to being empirically justified than any of our moral beliefs, and I argue that it does not even show that. Surprisingly, however, the full range of our moral beliefs could be empirically justified, albeit in a different way. Unlike mathematics, there's no apparent ground on which to rule out so-called moral perceptions as being on an epistemic par with ordinary judgments ascribing high level properties like there's a chair. I conclude with the prospect that there may be no principal distinction between intuition and perception, and hence between a priori and a posteriori justification. Having shown that our mathematical beliefs have no better claim to being defeasively justified than our moral beliefs, in chapter four, I consider attempts to undermine the latter by appeals to their genealogy, what have become known as genealogical debunking arguments. I argue that as standardly formulated, such arguments misunderstand the epistemic significance of explanatory indispensability. Debunkers observe that whether the proposition that P is implied by some explanation of our coming to believe that P is predictive of its having epistemically desirable qualities when the fact that P would be causally efficacious if it obtained. The problem is that these things are independent when the fact that P would be causally inert and genealogical debunking arguments fallaciously assume otherwise. I formulate a principle that I call modal security, which entails a criterion of adequacy on genealogical debunking arguments, a criterion they fail to satisfy. But even if modal security is false, I argue that such arguments have little force absent account of the epistemic quality they're supposed to threaten. I conclude that the real problem to which genealogical debunking arguments point is the so-called Benassaraf problem, that is, the problem of explaining the reliability of our moral beliefs, realistically construed. However, this problem has nothing to do with whether the contents of our moral beliefs are implied by some explanation of our coming to have them, nothing to do with their genealogy. In chapter five, I consider the Benassaraf problem or what I call the reliability challenge in detail. I consider various ways to understand the challenge. I show that its most promising formulations involve variations of the truths or variations of our beliefs. The best version of the former is the challenge to show that our beliefs are sensitive in the epistemologist sense. That is roughly that had the truths been different, our beliefs would have been correspondingly different. This challenge is widely supposed to admit of an evolutionary answer in the mathematical case, but not in the moral. I argue that on the contrary, the sensitivity challenge may admit of an evolutionary answer in the moral case and not the mathematical. But in any case, I argue that this is an inadequate formulation of the challenge. So this leaves only analyses in terms of the variation of our beliefs. The best version of this is the challenge to show that our beliefs, uh, sorry, our beliefs are safe in the epistemologist sense, roughly that we could not have easily had systematically false ones. 
Understanding the reliability challenge is the challenge to show that our beliefs are safe explains the otherwise mysterious conviction that the view that I will call mathematical pluralism affords an answer to the reliability challenge. It also illuminates the significance of genealogy in a certain sense uh, and disagreement. I conclude that whether the reliability challenge is equally pressing in the moral and mathematical cases thus turns on whether pluralism is equally viable in the two areas. The rough idea to pluralism about an area F is that any F-like theory that we might have accepted is true of the entities which it's, it is about independent of human minds and languages. In chapter six, I show that while standard formulations of pluralism are dubiously coherent, the view can be refined and the resulting theory does seem to answer the reliability challenge for F realism, understood as the challenge to show that our F beliefs are safe. Uh, it does so by giving up on the objectivity of the truths in the sense of chapter one, but not on their independence, not on the realism. However, there's a key difference between the mathematical and moral cases. Under the assumption of mathematical pluralism, peculiarly mathematical as opposed to logical questions get deflated. They become verbal in roughly the sense in which the parallel postulate question is verbal, understood as a question of pure mathematics. Um, by contrast, under the assumption of moral pluralism, all the pressing questions remain. Those are the practical questions, what to do. We can frame the point as a radicalization of Moore's famous open question argument. Practical questions remain open even when the facts, including the evaluative ones, if there are any, uh, are closed. This means that mathematics and morality, if it is practical, do differ, but the concept of realism alone is too crude to do justice to the difference. Although practical realism is false, practical questions are objective in a paradigmatic respect. And while mathematical realism is true, mathematical questions fail to be. One upshot of the discussion is that the concepts of realism and objectivity uh, are not only distinct, but are actually in tension. I conclude by sketching the broader significance of the book's conclusions. I suggest a general partition of areas of philosophical interest into those that are more like mathematics and those that are more like morality. In the former category are questions of modality, grounding, essence, logic, and muriology. In the latter are questions of epistemology, political philosophy, aesthetics, and prudential reasoning. I argue that um, the former questions are like the question of whether the parallel postulate is true, understood as a question of uh, a pure mathematical conjecture. They're verbal, but not because they're literally about words. Uh, they're verbal because reality is rich enough as to witness any view we might have given on them. I illustrate this conclusion with questions of modality. I argue that just as there are different concepts of geometrical point and line all independently satisfied, there are different concepts of modality or counterfactual possibility. While it is say metaphysically impossible that you could have had different parents, famous argument from Sal Kripke is, is sound, it's logically possible that you could have, and there's nothing more real uh, about metaphysical possibility than logical possibility. In general, while typical questions of modal metaphysics are not about the word possible, they might as well be, because all we learn in answering them is how we happen to be using modal vocabulary rather than learning what modal reality contains. By contrast, evaluative questions, insofar as they are practical, are immune to deflation in this way. But the reason that they are is that they don't answer to the facts. So their objectivity is not compromised if the facts are abundant. I conclude that the objective questions in the neighborhood of questions of modal metaphysics, grounding, essence, and so forth are therefore practical questions as well. Practical philosophy should therefore take center stage. Thanks. David? So I go straight in now. Thank you, I was uh, waiting for a prompt. That's fine, that's great. Thank you very much, Justin. And I should say from the start that I really enjoyed reading your book. It's a kind of novel approach to a set of traditional issues and uh, made me think a lot. I learned a lot. It's great, great stuff. So I want, I want to uh, make a few comments and, and raise a query at the end and maybe a little suggestion about how to, how to deal with the query. So as you explained, you, you, you set it up by posing a challenge to naturalism. I'm going to query this uh, terminology of naturalism in a second, but, but uh, that's not an important thing. That, that your, your target is, is a standard view that's, that's uh, in philosophy that's, that's 
realist about science and therewith about mathematics, but uh, non-realist, anti-realist about about morality. And that's kind of the standard naturalist view. I mean, there's, there's the hard stuff, there's science, and then there's all this kind of opinion. We're not serious about that. And you have some, you have some nice quotes illustrating it. And uh, the main body of your book uh, uh, attacks this stance by, by arguing uh, uh, by a number of routes that there's no good epistemological basis for this disanalogy, that it looks as if all the epistemological arguments uh, make mass and morality stand or fall together, indeed, indeed, by and large, make them stand together. Now, so I'm, I'm, I'm all for this attitude. In fact, when it comes to me, you've been, you're pushing at an open door. In fact, more than an open door. Uh, uh, I'm somebody who's always been rather suspicious about pure mathematics, but uh, uh, not so suspicious about morality. I mean, so I, I might challenge you on whether, whether uh, uh, it's part of naturalism that they should uh, be pro-mass and anti-morality. I mean, I'm a naturalist. I wrote a book called Philosophical Naturalism, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm rather the other, other way around. But uh, uh, no, I mean, the, the, the terminology doesn't, doesn't matter. The question is, uh, uh, do they stand or fall together? In fact, I've been rather more suspicious of mathematics than morality because of the abstractness of mathematics. So there's no question but that mathematical entities, sets, numbers, real numbers are outside space and time. They have no special <laughs> temporal location. They don't enter into causal relationships. Everybody, everybody agrees about that. So, and morality, not so much. Is that outside space and time? One would think that the, you know, uh, being good, being bad is a characteristic of, of acts uh, that take place inside space and time. It's not, it's not at all so obvious that, that uh, uh, moral facts aren't, aren't part of the concrete world kind of things that can enter into causal relations. And that's always made me feel, you know, kind of following Hartree Field, that, that, that surely mass should be dispensable in giving a characterization of what's going on in the concrete world. Right? I mean, I agree that the fact is it's dispensable for describing the concrete world doesn't mean we have to be anti-realists about it. That doesn't follow. But still, it's an interesting disanalogy between the mass and the morality, which seems to count against count against the mass. Uh, I mean, you, you chuck in at one point that uh, mass might be dispensable for describing the concrete world, but it's not dispensable for doing metalogic. Uh, interesting line of line of thought, but that kind of reminded me of David Lewis at some point says, I'm in, in a different context, but about what you ought to be. He said, I'm not ready to take lessons in ontology from quantum mechanics as it is now, uh, i.e. quantum mechanics is a bit of an ontological uh, uh, quagmire. And I feel slightly the same about metalogic. I'm, I, I'm never quite clear about what's the ontological commitments of the things that get said in mental logic. So I'm not too quick to think that uh, you, can, you can read off commitments from the use of certain uh, uh, devices in metal logic. But still, right, and, and, and enough, enough uh, uh, about what I think about these matters. Let me have a look at, at your ending point, because it's very, it's very interesting. So, so you save mathematical realism by going pluralistic. I mean, is, is, the, is the parallel posture True, uh, yes, in some abstract geometries, yes, Euclidean geometry, in others, not. Uh, all these geometries exist. There's no real issue about which is the right geometry. They're all kind of geometry-like uh, 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 subject matters. And the only real issue is which do we want to talk about? So we, we save realism, all these geometries exist by giving up on objectivity. There's no, there's no need to decide which is the right one. 
Okay, and then you make the point that the same line isn't going to work with morality. I mean, so we might say, um, is, it, is it right to allow immigration? And then somebody might say, well, yes, it's, 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 it's right. It's right one, it's right according to, to the uh, code of liberal cosmopolitanism and it's, it's, and it's, it's not right Two, it's not right according to uh, the code of the uh, traditionalist nationalist. And you might say, well, why can't we just rest like that? Like, you know, parallel prostitutes, par parallel postulates, two according to one, one notion of geometry, not according to another. But of course, as you point out, that, that can't be a happy resting point because there's still the question about what to do. Should we have immigration or not? And that that hasn't gone away. And you say that means that morality is objective in a way that, that mathematics is not. We have to we have to answer answer that question. And you conclude that because we have to answer that question, we can't be realists about morality. We can't think that moral judgments answer to to some set of independent facts. They're, they're just about what to, what to do. So, okay, that's, that, that's all very cogent argument, but I'm, I was slightly left feeling, I didn't know what to think at that point about, about moral discourse or more generally discourse about what to do. Look, people, are discussing what to do. They will give, give reasons in favor of this course of action or that reasons for allowing more immigration or, or not. And it's not clear to me on your account that you can give any good account of what they are aiming to do there. I mean, of course, I mean, is the, the expressivist can't, they're, they're just kind of expressing their preferences, but that doesn't look like a happy account of, of what's, what's going on when offers, when offers reasons but I mean if on your account the giving of reasons I mean this is the right thing to do this is not doesn't answer to any facts I don't quite understand what we're to make of that kind of discourse and at that point I wondered whether one should go go back and uh, feel that maybe there's one one kind of right that's right for us I mean in the case of geometry, if we go back down to the concrete world and away from the world of, of abstract geometries, there is a fact of the matter uh, 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 and an objective one about which is, I mean, are real lines, uh, do they satisfy the parallel postulate? No, no, I mean, that's a pretty straightforward uh, non-pluralist answer, uh, which is simultaneously realist when we ask a concrete question. And it wasn't clear to me what would be wrong with taking the line that uh, when we're asking about uh, moral matters or, or questions of what to do generally, that we aren't talking about, about uh, values or reasons, whichever way you want to set it up, for us, uh, uh, for the community that we're part of, uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps the human community. And then we can see it as citing, citing facts, features of the, the situation, perfectly naturalistically acceptable facts that, that we know will move, move the people in our community. Uh, that's a way of making sense of moral, moral discourse that uh, goes back to its being both objective and realistic. Now, of course, that presupposes that, that uh, we're in a community where people are going to be moved by the same things. And uh, maybe uh, if we were speaking to Martians, uh, then we wouldn't be with a community uh, uh, of that kind. And we'd be talking past each other, uh, uh, just like people arguing about uh, uh, lines when, in fact, they're thinking in terms of different abstract geometries. But it's not obvious to me that, that uh, we're in that situation with human beings. Maybe we are. Maybe there are different communities of human beings who are incommensurably different in terms of what moves them. And then, and then 
we'll be talking past each other in those cases too. And if so, so be it. But at least that gives us some account of what we're doing when we engage in evaluative discourse that seemed to me to be missing on your story. So I'll stop, I'll stop there. I mean, nothing, nothing uh, uh, very much to disagree about, except uh, there seemed to me a gap leave, left at the end, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you, David. Michael? Well, thank you very much for in inviting me and for giving me the opportunity to read Justin's, Justin's uh, book and uh, to uh, put up with my misconceptions and, and my fuzzy terminology for the next uh, eight minutes or so. Uh, when I first saw Justin's title, I assumed his book was about the immorality that is rife in mathematics. Uh, that is a very timely topic, but Justin's book is about uh, timeless philosophical questions that we mathematicians have trouble formulating coherently on our own. I found it covers an amazing range of such questions for such a short book. And in my time, I'll just touch on two about which I can hope to say something coherent. Uh, the question of mathematical pluralism, of course, which is raised explicitly as part of his solution to the question of realism in morality versus mathematics. Uh, I should say I'm convinced by this solution, which corresponds to my practice, although I would draw different conclusions. I may try to make that clear. Then the question of morality within mathematics in the sense of what mathematicians should do, which is implicit throughout the book, but is sometimes obscured by treating ethical matters as metaphysics. There's a tradition going back to Plato, at least, of philosophers complaining about the thoughtlessness and confusion of mathematicians, and a more recent tradition of philosophers taking the attitude that, of course, mathematicians should not worry about the issues that concern philosophers because we have more important things to do. Uh, I've heard that. This hints at an uneasy superiority complex, which is easily matched on the mathematician's side, where the unease, as you might imagine, comes to the surface when we wake up in the middle of the night, as I actually did last night, wondering whether there is anything real about what we're doing. A handful of mathematicians deal with this sort of anxiety by more or less loudly proclaiming their Platonism, since they include some familiar names, people like Steven Pinker, quoted in the book, assume that mathematicians on the whole are realist. Justin doesn't make that mistake, although occasionally he displays more realism about mathematicians than I would, uh, using language that suggests that we are a natural kind. For example, at one point he writes that mathematicians want to know what is true if the axioms are true. Now, this is valid as folk philosophy, as a rough way of distinguishing the priorities of mathematicians from those of ethicists, and helps to explain why episodes of metaphysical night sweats are so infrequent among mathematicians. And it's a plausible explanation of why we do what we do. But as a definition of mathematicians, it ascribes wants differently than I would. The mathematicians I know want to prove theorems and then, and this is also important, want to know why the proof works. The word truth appears rarely in mathematics and then only as a convention like uh, QED. I would replace want in the above by a moral descriptor like virtue of mathematical practice. Even though we use the word exist constantly, it's possible to embarrass some mathematicians by asking whether our objects really exist. I avoid embarrassment by limiting my ontological commitment to the reality of mathematical ideas. Here, I paraphrase Ian Hacking. Uh, if you can steal ideas, then they are real. And I wish more philosophers could explain how it's possible for the ideas to be real when the reality of the objects to which the ideas refer is left unresolved, because ideas really are stolen. I can tell you some stories and all the time. And while this is naturally considered immoral, it's not incompatible with the morality of mathematics as a discipline, as a practice maybe, but as a, but as a discipline, no. But there's another way to restore realism to mathematics and that's by entrusting it to machines. These days, more prominent mathematicians, far more, worry that we will be replaced by machines than worry about the, axiom, the truth of the axioms of set theory. I have a question uh, for Justin in particular. What does the correct operation of mechanical proof verification say about mathematical realism or truths or beliefs? 
does this count as Putnam's if thenism, which Justin calls anti realist? But if the machine is entrusted with the standards for the ideal mathematician, does that not make questions about mathematical pluralism moot? Unless there are competing Apple and Android versions, each guaranteeing better than 95% modal security. Someone has actually already imagined a mechanical morality verifier and proposed it in something called the NSF 2026 idea machine. Uh, can a driverless car be programmed to follow moral rules strictly about choosing between running over 10 university professors or 10 school children? And would we want to program it in that way or would pluralism, more pluralism be desirable, a virtue in both situations? With regard to mathematical pluralism, Mathematical practice may well look pluralistic to outsiders. Non-Euclidean versus Euclidean geometry has long ceased to be a matter of controversy. There's just differential geometry, which includes Euclidean as one of many, uncountably many possibilities. Contemporary mathematics is more opportunistic when it comes to, to set theory. To construct etal cohomology, Grotendieck introduced his universes, which require inaccessible cardinals. Uh, which Quine called uh, recreational mathematics, I discovered. Uh, Vyavotsky's univalent, univalent foundation is even require an infinite increasing sequence of inaccessible cardinals. Every topologist and algebraic geometer works with a category of sets, which is too big to be a set. And most number theorists I've asked claim neither to know nor to care about these or miller frankel axioms. But this doesn't lead to something like a mathematical multiverse on the model of a moral multiverse where setting cats on fire is immoral in one world, but no big deal in another. If two groups of mathematicians come up with incompatible solutions to a problem, then the community's moral obligation is to swoop in and begin a process, not an algorithm, which is uh, as Justin refers to one uh, late in the book, much like the one dramatized in Lakatos's proofs and refutations that will persist until consensus is achieved. So pluralism about what is considered correct mathematics is impossible with a socially social structure of actually existing human, not to mention mechanical mathematics. So this reveals the moral content of the question of realism about mathematicians. Are actually existing mathematicians, even wor the world experts, Justin quotes at one point, acceptable substitutes for the morally ideal stu stewards of mathematical truth? I conclude by saying maybe, if what I just described illustrates in practice the reflective equilibrium discussed in the early part of the book, I would have liked to see related to pluralism. And finally, is this, is this a practical question? Thanks very much, Michael. And now we turn to Katya. I want to thank Justin for the invitation to join this panel and Michelle for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to participate. Justin and I have discussed the ideas that figure in his book many times and he kind of knows where I'm coming from. Uh, but I, I keep enjoying the discussion. I sort of want to thank him for, for all the you know, amazing conversations over the years about the material in the book. I, I really enjoyed it and feel I, I learned a lot from them. Now, Justin writes with deep insight about both morality and mathematics, and I think that is a huge accomplishment. Most of us know a lot more about one or the other. Um, so so I'm, I think that is, that is a big deal, but I want to invite you, Justin, to talk a little more about the morality side of things. And I have kind of three, topics or, or questions that I want to pose. And one is about just sort of the nature of normativity or how you see moral normativity relate to other kinds of normativity. The second is about what you think of the like theoretical framework um, that people may bring to bear or not when they have moral disagreements. And the third is about whether you think there is an affective dimension to disagreement. Now, the first question is going to take a little longer than the other ones, um, but it kind of lays out a little bit um, where I'm coming from and also something that I think is important to your project in your comparison between morality and mathematics. A lot is about how in both fields people disagree. And as you know, that that interests me also a lot. And I want to ask you sort of as the first question, whether you think that ultimately there are going to be 
kind of these two domains as you described them now in your intro that there's going to be like the practical domain on the one hand and questions of fact as you call it on the other hand and you were saying in your intro now that sort of in the same on the same side of things where you put mathematics you would also put modality and maybe also some other things and on the side where you put um morality you would also put political philosophy and some other things and in the book you you use um kind of traditional distinctions between kinds of normativity so for example moral versus prudential normativity or moral versus epistemic normativity and there is a kind of promise at the end of the book that what you have to say about moral normativity either sort of carries over to these other kinds of normativity or at least has somehow implications for it and I wanted to ask you about another kind of normativity and how it fits or doesn't fit into the picture, namely social norms or, or societal, cultural norms, maybe even legal norms, because it seems to me that maybe they are on the other side of your comparison. And that might pose a problem for a kind of unified conception of normativity or for this distinction between practical questions and questions of fact. Now, think about a customary norm, say I should wear black when I go to a funeral in this country, and I should wear white when I go to a funeral in another country. Now, to my mind, that is a little bit like different answers to the parallel postulate question in Euclidean and hyperbolic geometry. I cannot do both things at once, but I can travel between the two cultures and I could, can do one thing if I'm in one culture and the other thing when I'm in the other culture. And there's kind of nothing very disturbing or puzzling or complicated about it in the same way in which you argue there isn't anything really disturbing about one answer to the parallel postulate question Euclidean geometry and another answer in um, hyperbolic geometry. So I'm thinking that there might be kinds of norms that just sort of don't really fit into the picture. And that is a question that I have whether you would acknowledge that or, you know, maybe then cultural norms or societal norms on your view aren't really sort of properly speaking norms in the full sense. But that would be an interesting thing to learn more about. The second question is, you assume that when people disagree morally, that they bring to bear theoretical frameworks. And that is kind of part of the comparison between morality and mathematics. In both fields, you assume that people who disagree kind of think in theoretical frameworks in, in you know, in geometry, hyperbolic or, or Euclidean geometry. In morality, you say, as an example, someone may think in a consequentialist framework or a deontologist framework. Now, I have to say that I'm kind of doubtful about this as a sort of general description of moral disagreement. I think that a lot of times people, when they morally disagree, they don't necessarily sort of endorse or formulate for themselves a theoretical framework. And on the contrary, it kind of seems to me that often when we disagree, and also, also when we kind of disagree in important ways, say the example that, that David mentioned about immigration or, you know, very important questions, I think we actually often share kind of imprecise versions of general ideas. We're sort of in the same framework, but we still disagree in, in very, you know, <laughs> seemingly irresolvable ways. And I just sort of wonder whether that fits anywhere into your framework. And the third and last question is about affective dimensions of disagreement. Now, I've been sort of struck by the fact that that doesn't come up in your analysis of moral disagreement. And I tend to think that that is a very salient dimension of disagreement that, people, you know, there's a characteristic set of, of attitudes that people have when they disagree. They are offended or hurt or they fight or they um, distance themselves from each other or whatever. And then I was thinking, you know, maybe you are not treating that as a feature of your account because maybe you think that is only on one side of the comparison. And you're starting out from features of morality and, and mathematics that they kind of, at least, you know, at a first glance have in common. But then I'm thinking, you know, theorists can also fight. And what Michael was just saying seems to bear on that question that theorizers, you know, either they love the truth or maybe they put it not quite that nobly. Maybe there's something else. But theorizers can certainly also get into fights when they disagree. So maybe that is not the way to, to look at it. And then I was thinking that maybe you think that this kind of affective dimension doesn't bear on the metaphysics and epistemology of value. And that is, after all, what the book is about. <laughs> 
But here I just sort of want to raise a question because one could also think that it is a, truly an insight about the nature of value that it shows up for us from the perspective of agency and that it motivates and moves us and that people kind of you know want that which they see as good and so on and so forth and if that is true then that actually does bear immediately on the metaphysics and epistemology of value and i'm just sort of interested whether that would fit into the picture thank you so much everyone katya that was a wonderful ending to the panel discussion I wonder if we want to give Justin a few minutes to try to respond to, to these questions that have been posed before the audience questions, maybe just a few minutes. Uh, sure, thanks. I, um, uh, uh, I didn't expect to have opportunities. So yeah, th thank you for the fantastic uh, questions. Um, maybe I'll go in, in reverse order. Um, so Katya, briefly my... Um, my thought on your question of uh, what's the difference between ethics and other norms, I'm with you in thinking the notion of ethics is kind of a hopelessly indeterminate notion and that that should it, we, we, we probably shouldn't put too much emphasis on that. Um, my feeling is that there's basically questions of what to do um, in a given cir concrete circumstance. So, you know, what dress am I going to wear <laughs> today? <laughs> um, uh, and then there's basically norms that can be laid out kind of like different constitutions, and they become normative in some sense only to the extent that I adopt them as answers to the question of what to do. So in that, in that sense, nothing, morality, cultural norms, epistemic norms, nothing is normative in, the fa in that sense as, a, as just a bunch of constitutions or a bunch of factual claims about what to do. Um, but, 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 you know, the, the activity of asking what to do and answering that question, that is, it seems to me like, if anything deserves the name morality, it's that. Um, that's anyway, what it seems to me that we should be focused on it, at, as philosophers. Um, so about the frameworks thing, um, so my feeling is that you're absolutely right that sort of for simplicity, I talk about like the deontologist and the consequentialist asking about whether to kill the one to save the five as if, the, as if this were at all representative of a normal conversation. Um, but I actually don't, you're absolutely, I completely agree with the point that people don't walk around with moral frameworks in their head. Um, but I don't actually think that establishes a disanalogy. So for example, um, among those few who care about the question of, for example, what axioms of set theory are true, um, very commonly the situation is both parties agree that the iterative concept of set is the defining uh, concept. And the question is what kind of fills that out? So, you know, Bulos famously thought replacement is not part of that conception, whereas most people evidently do because they're part of the ZFC axioms. Um, so, so that's a case where we both have this kind of inco inchoate concept uh, or inchoate, you know, guiding picture, but there's a disagreement about a concrete proposition. And it seems to me like that's enough to get the problem going. Um, uh, because in the moral case, if we have a disagreement about the concrete question of whether to kill the one to save the five, we've either got to do it or not. In the mathematical case, I'm suggesting but I want to ask uh, Michael about this because I wasn't totally sure I understood what what, what his um, view was. In the mathematical case, I was suggesting why not? Why don't we treat it like geometry? Why don't we let there be kind of? Why don't we distinguish different kinds of iterative notions of set? And we have one that satisfies all instances of replacement and another that doesn't. Why? Why must we choose? Um, uh, Okay, and finally, the thing about, uh, you know, the affective attitudes and emotions. Um, so you're absolutely right. I think that's a essential feature. Um, I, I did try to say something about that in the, in the section on self-evidence. And what I said was, if anything, that seems to favor moral realism over mathematical realism. Because in the mathematical case, it's much harder to argue that people are arguing because they have personal investment or religious commitments or distorting influences that are affecting their ability to have a sort of careful conversation about the, the matter. Whereas in the ethical case, you know, 
ethical questions are so tied to all these things that we care so much about, as you say, they tend to get rapidly heated and it's hard to, you know, the, the ideal would be one where it's just kind of an intellectual back and forth, somebody might say. Um, so I tried to talk about it a little there and its relevance, but, but the short answer to the, the question of what, where do I think it fits in is I think it supports ultimately the non-cognitivism I advocate at the end about what to do. Because if practical questions are non-factual questions about what to do, it's no wonder that we're gonna get very worked up about it because it's about action and what's gonna to happen to us and, and others. Um, rather than about, you know, the, you know, the platoplasm in, in uh, uh, you know, whatever. So, um, so anyway, the, obviously that's just off the top of my head. Um, so, so David, um, let's see. So, um, so your thought at the end was that, um, uh, that why, why, okay, so I, I'm advocating a kind of non-cognitivism and, you know, famous problem for non-cognitivism is the frege Geach problem, which is how to explain the apparent rationality of, uh, of ethics if it's really just a way of expressing non-cognitive attitudes. On that specific matter, I'm inclined to basically follow Gibbard. So I think, I think questions of what, what we ought to do in the practical sense are questions of what to do, this is a matter of hyper plans. And, you know, you can recover what looks like standard logic, not understood in terms of truth conditions in a heavy duty sense, um, uh, in just the way Gibber does in, is in thinking how to live. Now, why prefer that to what you were suggesting, which is a sort of naturalist, um, non pluralist ethics or something? Well, my thought is that even if you're right, um, the argument for non-cognitivism wasn't supposed to turn on the actual truth of moral pluralism. It was supposed to just proceed from the assumption of it. The idea is that if moral pluralism turned out to be true, and by the way, there is an argument in there arguing that it's hard to see how it could fail to be true, actually, once you start to think about it. I mean, surely there's Mill's properties and Kant's properties and Boyd's properties out there, we can ask the semantic question of which we happen to be referring to, but at a metaphysical level, what's there to dispute? Um, the claim was, if, if pluralism were assumed to be true, there would be a further question. Now, what would that question be? Suppose I ought one to kill the five, to, 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 kill, uh, to kill the one to save the five, I ought to not. Now, suppose I say the further question is, yeah, well, whether I all things considered ought to kill the one to save the five or something like that. Well, now I can just index the all things considered things and re-ask the question. There's always a further question and it can't be a question of ought on pain of triviality because I always deontological ought to do what I deontological ought to do. And I always utilitarian ought to do what I utilitarian ought to do. There seems to be a question of all things considered what I ought to do, but that can't literally be the right story for the reason I just mentioned. So I call that remaining question the what to do question. That doesn't mean that answering the what to do question, in order to answer it, we can't just get by by consulting these natural properties you, you think maybe that we all feel moved by um, and, and adopting those to use the language I just used in response to Katya as normative. But the point is that they're not gonna settle the practical question by themselves. We have to, we have to adopt them and that's a practical move on our part that's a what you know whether to use the whether to consult those properties okay um finally uh michael um uh so um so uh, uh frankly i just had a couple questions about your your questions because I, I i really appreciated them so um the the um the first question is you started out by saying that you yourself i as i understood it consider yourself a pluralist. Um, but as I understood the end of your comments, they were sort of critical of pluralism or worried about pluralism because we have a moral imperative to arrive at some kind of consensus rather than letting a hundred flowers blossom. And so, so could I, could you just, I think I didn't understand the position you were, you were trying to ask me about, or maybe this is not the time, but that's, so okay, so so I, I wonder what kind of pluralism you you feel sympathetic to. Um, the 
the the final question about um, is this a practical question? If this was referring to whether to require convergence or something, um, then yes, I would say that's a practical question. But I wasn't sure what this was referring to when you said, is this a practical question? Um, uh, the, the proof checker thing is very interesting, but what I would be inclined to say is that requires at most the actual truth preservation of a system of logic and not even the, the correctness of the logic, because the correctness of the logic would require the validity. That is not just the actual truth preservation, but the truth preservation in all logically possible cases of the inference rules. So this doesn't require, of course, we can program certain axioms and so forth as well, but I don't see why that would in any way vindicate the idea that there's a one true, uh, you know, that, that, that there's a one true theory about the universe of sets or something. So but, just, um, yeah. okay, but that's it, that's, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Thanks so much. Let's take a couple of questions from the audience. One of them is going to ask you um, to follow up a little bit on the non-cognitivism issue. So this comes from Devin Morse. Is there a correct answer to the question what to do? If so, why doesn't this immediately give rise to the existence of a certain moral fact, namely, a is the thing to do, which is then subject to the same deflationary pluralism. I'll actually stop there and let you, and let you take that up. Um, good. So here's, let me, uh, so I'm not, I don't have, I can't take the time to read the parenthetical thing. So let me know if I'm missing something important, but um, uh, so let me try to put your worry in an even more worrisome way. Um, uh, in order to deal with the frege Geach problem that David brought up, I better be a deflationist about semantic concepts. And so that means that there's nothing to stop me from introducing a truth predicate whenever I have a declarative sentence and whenever I'm willing to claim P, claim that P is true and so forth. Well, okay, so now suppose I stipulatively introduce the term, that's the thing to do, or you know, killing the one to save the five is the thing to do uh, for the state of mind of intending to do it, roughly speaking. Um, well, then it's true. And now can't I run pluralism? Because now I can say that's the, that's the thing to do. Uh, it's not the thing to do star. And now there's a question of whether to do the thing to do or the thing to do star. It seems like I can just rerun the worry. In other words, why doesn't the, um, the kind of new open question style worry just re-arise at the level of what to do? And, um, my answer to this, though I agree that this is a kind of deep problem, is that, um, well, yeah, I can, language is conventional and I can use a declarative sentence to express whatever I want to, but the question I'm asking is not a question of fact, it's a question of intention, and I can only intend to do one thing at a time. So to the answer to the question, is there a right answer? Certainly there's a right answer out of my mouth, if you want some kind of God's eye answer, that requires somehow, um, you know, getting outside of morality or what to do questions. And as a deflationist, I think, you know, just like Blackburn and Gibbard and all those people, those are, it's going to be morality all the way down. So when we start doing metaphysics of morality at that level, it's just going to be more what to do questions. And so, of course, there's a right answer uh, because do that. And even if I hadn't thought to do that, do that is what, you know, the, the kind of thing that I would uh, say. But this is a, this is a deep question uh, and I, I agree it's a problem. Thanks, Justin. So we've got a, a sort of historical question um, that you might want to try to, to answer. What, does, what do you think of Locke's abandoned promise to provide a mathematical demonstration of morality in the essay concerning human understanding? Or you know you may not have a position on it, but just I think the questioner is curious about that. Yeah, so you know I do briefly talk about Locke's discussion. It's in an extended footnote that probably everybody was like, I don't have time for this. Um, but um, so so look, I don't have anything to say about the bio the biographical lock. What I would say though about the position is that I think these kinds of positions according to which 
um, the basic principles of ethics are as self-evident as the basic principles of math. Um, you know, the, the chapter two is trying to defend the view that yeah, that's right, but not because they're self-evident, but because neither of them is. Um, so in other words, they are on a par. Locke was right to draw an analogy between, between uh, ethics and math. The, 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 the naive thought is not that they're on a par, but that somehow the axioms of math, again, the axioms, I'm not talking about logic for a second. I'm not talking about what is true if the axioms are talking about things like that every non-empty set has a choice function or the replacement axiom or whatever, um, the, the naive thought is that those are self-evident or that, you know, that there's an inductive set is self-evident. So, um, so on, on the question basically of like, you know, was Locke right? I actually think he probably was, probably not for the reason he thought he, thought he was though. Um, yeah. Great. So we've actually got a questioner who wants to hear uh, Professor Harris address the um, questions that Justin raised about his commentary. Oh, I, I apologize for that. The uh, uh, first, I mean, the uh, I guess all of the questions uh, presuppose. Uh, if I were to give complete answers, presuppose trying to explain my thoughts about where the line is drawn between philosophy of mathematics and sociology of mathematics, and whether there's a, a mathematics that is the same for uh, mathematicians and philosophers and brains in vats and, and Martians, <laughs> or whether there's uh, there when when uh, Google or whoever gets the patent for the future of mathematics, then that's the, that's the only one that, uh, that's left and, and mathematicians are replaced by machines, then, uh, then why would the philosophers even bother asking about it? But so that's, the, that's, my, that's my comment on the, on, the, uh, on, on the pluralism there. Now, as for my, what I said about pluralism, I used the word opportunism. And so whether that's, uh, the same as pluralism or not is, uh, is uh, a, a complicated question, but in practice, there are different groups of mathematicians who at different times decide to uh, stretch the axioms because uh, of that gets them where they want to go. And then actually, they, they are, they, you sometimes see uh, apologetic statements like, well, in a very influential book, this is a nuisance. Uh, if, if I had, you know, uh, several thousand more pages, I could, I could avoid making this hypothesis. But you know, I don't. And you don't want to see them anyway. Uh, as, but the, uh, but this, whether the, whether the uh, re requirement of convergence uh, is a sociological uh, re requirement, a practical requirement, or somehow it's whether that can be separated from whatever mathematics is, is. Uh, it's, uh, I don't think it's in conflict in any sense with what I, what I described as, as opportunism. Now, it, it so happens that I did spend some time with uh, set theorists. Uh, uh, I'm not a set theorist. That, that marks me as an outlier among number theorists. But I spent uh, a week with a bunch of set theorists, including uh, Hugh Wooden. And my understanding was that they wanted to find the axiom that would get them the, the answer uh, to the continuum hypothesis, plus a whole bunch of other things that were special, special interest to, uh, for set theorists. And in that sense, uh, you know, the, there's, you could say, call there, there, there a, either a tension between pluralism and, 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 uh, and its opposite, or maybe, maybe uh, that they are working together. So that's, uh, I guess that's, that's enough of a, uh, Thanks so much. So I'm going to suggest that since it's 314, we have time to go a little over for uh, Justin to answer one more question from the audience. This is from Siddharth Krishnan. Several questions in mathematics have been around for a lot longer before there was a recognition there could be alternative conflicting sets of axioms. Questions in number theory, like Fermat's last theorem are like this. So what drove agreement about the centrality of these problems, Siddharth asks. Was the acceptance 
of one of many different axiomatic systems just driven by intuition or culture, uh, but even after the recognition of alternative systems, don't we still think these questions are central? Um, so I'll give you a chance to answer that and then we'll, we'll uh, wrap up. Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's actually, I, I do address that question in, in chapter two in reference to Pell's equation. Um, uh, you know, it's an, uh, it's an interesting historical fact that in, that, um, that, you know, isol figures that were isolated across the globe independently arrived at the same conclusions about, you know, certain, like, say, number theoretic claims. Um, the, you know, th th there was a, there's a, there's a suggestion in the book that many claims of the form P out of a mathematician's mouth are best understood as if thenist claims, like, you know, if the axioms are true than that, like, if you really press them, no, I'm not trying to take a stand on metaphysics or something. I'm saying if, you know, this is, this is a, there's a valid proof to this claim from the axioms. Um, but your point is that, well, what about before the time that there were any agreed upon axioms? I mean, the axiomization of arithmetic is a relatively recent event. How do we understand convergence on certain claims, at least in number theory, before that? We can't take them as shorthand for these sorts of conditional claims. And my view on this is that this is an interesting fact, and um, you can start to give an explanation of, of the convergence on arithmetic claims in terms of the connection between arithmetic and first order logic, uh, which would obviously be uh, useful to to do correctly uh, in, in avoiding predators, for example, uh, first order logic about objects in our environment. Now that won't get you that far. It's not gonna get you to things like about primes and so forth, but that is something that's true also in the moral case. So for example, I mean, Michelle's own work actually, you know, talks about, um, you know, uh, the, the extent to which um, there are norms that are cross-cultural and the extent to which um, uh, you can find non-trivial claims that it's, it, it, it seems like uh, people have independently arrived at despite their mutual isolation. What would be really striking is if beyond the kinds of claims we see in the ethical case, which of course don't begin to settle all the kinds of ethical debates we have, you saw this kind of convergence on things like choice among totally independent people independent mathematics developing, you know, there's a quote from Pudlock at the end about, you know, determinacy versus choice. I mean, it would be very interesting if you could somehow establish that. But unfortunately, I just don't think that's true. I think that there's a lot of contingency about how the foundations of math arose, and it could have gone differently, in my view. Anyway, I, I, it seems to me like there's no compelling reason to think it couldn't have. Um, so that's the short version, but it is something that I discuss, and I think it's a good point to to, to have in mind in, in thinking of thinking through the kind of simplistic if thenism that that sometimes I uh, I feel tempted to espouse. <laughs> That's great, Justin. It's also a great conclusion to our discussion today. Before we say goodbye and thank the panelists, I want to just remind people that to follow up on these issues that Justin's just raised, you can go into the chat box and find the link to the bookseller. It gives you a bit of a, of a discount on the book. And now I'd really like to thank our panelists. Justin, it was, it's a wonderful book and it's provocative and challenging and you reminded us of that. Uh, David and Michael and Katya, I wanna thank all of you for wonderful commentary and, and challenge to, uh, to our author. Um, and I wanna thank the audience for, uh, for being a wonderful um, sort of backdrop for this discussion. Thank you all so much. And this will bring the public portion of the event to, to a close. Thanks again. Thank you.